Now we're gonna talk about national accreditation standards for inclusive higher education programs. And so Deborah, again, thank you for joining us today and for sharing this very important information. Thank you, Drew, and um, I appreciate your comments. Is my slide view okay? My audio is groovy? Okay. Everything um, is good, yes. Okay. I'm going to focus on, this is the agenda for this presentation. I wanna give you the context for the, um, accreditation standard development and what has happened over the last, if you will, 11 years. And um, which would include some of the, the, each work route had a distinct purpose or scope of work. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So you'll have some context. And then I'm going to uh, go over the report to Congress that just went out, and uh, it, which is so exciting. One, that it's finished. Two, that um, it's in the hands of potential lawmakers um, to look at some changes. And because it makes um, a number of recommendations, both to different committees in Congress and um, to the Secretary of, at the Department of Education. Then I'll close with um, the new acc accreditation work group plans and um, questions and answers. Let me get rid of this. All of a sudden I'm getting all these things. Uh, and I, I've left time so that there will be questions, uh, time to answer questions. Okay, moving right along. Why is, is accreditation important? I think that's a good starting point. You know, I, when we first started this in 2010, the, uh, let me just back up for a sec. The, the National Coordinating Center, one of the key activities in its scope of work is to work on uh, accreditation to the point where there's a system, there's standards, in a process and systems for implementing those standards and that programs of, uh, that are at institutes of higher education can pursue accred being accredited. Uh, so that's always been in our scope of work from the very beginning. And I think it's important. At first, I, I didn't think we'd ever be where we are now. I, it just seemed like, wow. One, it was a world I knew nothing about other than a recipient of having to participate in accreditation at the College of Education that I worked in at the time. But it's, uh, I think these standards uh, really lay a foundation for quality and ongoing continuous improvement. It's um, something that the Florida programs have had standards of sorts and um, principles that they're working toward, but the field at large really hasn't until we started in 2010. So while it seems like a long time, it is just really a very short time for this to have occurred. And it's important because um, institutes of higher ed and college programs need that type of guidance to have a sense of um, are they doing a good job? Is it a quality program? And accrediting, an accrediting agency can't accredit without standards. So that, and I think it also uh, really is valuable to students and their parents because it gives them, when they start their college search, some key things to be looking for that are quality practices um, that, are, are really valuable. Overall, I think it, it really validates and provides credibility to the field. It, it really um, provides some way of starting to see more consistency also across different higher ed programs, 
right now the variability is quite striking um, across different areas. Uh, and I think these standards will lend themselves to um, more consistency and quality across the different programs. And last here is accreditation is how all higher education programs are really held accountable for what they're doing. So I think aligning with these key areas of importance, it, it really will help the field move forward. Okay, some of the historical background, if you will. Uh, in 2008, with the passage of the Higher Education Opportunities Act was the beginning of this work. And it really wasn't implemented till 2011 because the coordinating center was just getting going and laying um, the groundwork for, for the accreditation work group. And we formed the first work, work group in 2011. And it was very, the, the legislation was very, and the RFP we responded to as a result was very prescriptive. It told you exactly who the content expert was that had to be on that group. And we secured participation, like for example, someone with um, who trained teachers in special education, vocational rehab, an employment background, um, someone who knew higher education. Were the, that was the first work group. And Stephanie Smith-Lee, who was one of the founding members that um, got the legislation passed, agreed to be the first chairperson of this uh, work group. Then over the course of um, the next few year, two years, the model program standards were developed. And I gotta say, we secured incredible um, feedback from the public regarding those standards. Some were families and students, some of the feedback was a lot of it was from actual programs and um, people in higher education. And in 2016, the first report to Congress was filed and um, it was well received. The next chunk of activity was around field testing those standards. And um, we did a field test to, to get feedback from a whole wide variety of individuals in actual programs for students with intellectual disabilities, uh, rural, urban, um, East Coast, West Coast, um, North, South, uh, two year, four year. So we, it was a fairly robust field test. And I have to say, um, it was pretty intense. And as a result, the, the first model standards worked, I think changed significantly. We really listened to the feedback that we got. Um, it was interesting at the same time, we started the, the, the accreditation work group, started looking at, um, well, is there an existing accreditation agency that could um, help us or would want to host this activity of accrediting programs. And um, so we searched for an accrediting entity. At the same time, we had presented to the Council for Higher Education, and I have to read these. These are new acronyms for me the Council for Higher Education and Accreditation, CHEA, C-H-E-A. And they told us that we were missing student learning outcomes. So we formed a committee to take a look at that and um, I'll review some of what they came up with. And then, as I mentioned before, the, the um, second report to Congress uh, went out in, um, here it is, in 2020, actually last month. 
And we're really excited to have this, uh, to launch the work of the new accreditation work group. Um, and I think it's going to be critical that we take a look at these standards, not in this session, but in the future, and what these standards actually mean. There's 10 key areas and 38 um, actual standards within each of these core areas. And some, actually, it's important to note, these areas align with um, the existing Department of Education accreditation uh, standards for accreditors. So we really uh, spent time trying to uh, make sure all along the way to make sure that we were, these standards and the whole process is aligned with existing accreditation um, content and procedures. And you can see some of them are commonplace like mission, um, program development, planning and review, uh, administrative and fiscal capacity. These are areas that are not uncommon to most programs. Okay, the findings from the Accreditation Outreach, Commit Outreach Committee. What they did was, as I mentioned, looked at all existing accrediting entities but could not find one interested in using the standards. And th actually that's not 100% true. There was one who agreed to talk to us further, but they were in the business of accrediting medical oriented programs like nursing programs and so forth. And we felt that our field had just spent so many years trying to get away from a medical model that that probably wouldn't be a good fit. So we did not pursue that particular accreditor. The outreach committee actually surveyed all existing programs on the Think College database. Um, at the time, I think it was 289 programs. They surveyed them to find out, well, is there demand for accreditation in our field or, or is it too early? And it was interesting, um, over 80% said they were likely or very likely to participate and felt that it was um, an area that would really validate them, the um, movement of post-second development of post-secondary education programs in higher education. And they found that the cost of an agency, of establishing a, an agency was um, reasonable within the larger scheme of things. Okay. Whoops. The recommendation to Congress was to really look at um, funding an accrediting agency. And that's in the report that I mentioned before. You can see there's a whole list of the recommendations in the report and the standards and re related 38 different standards to the 10 key areas. So in that I've included that for download. Okay, the Student Learning Outcomes Committee, this is all in the uh, previous accreditation work group recommended a new standard and specifically to look at uh, student learning outcomes and to create individualized learning plans for each student who participated in an, uh, in a, an inclusive college uh, course. This meant the revised standards really uh, require written reports indicating what student progress is, is showing in the areas, the key areas of the legislation, which are the academic, socialization, independent living, and um, employment. And uh, it, it really looks at providing information and support 
to faculty and um, professional staff about the impact of having um, the, of the student's disability on learning and strategies to support and instruct the student. I think it's important where there's open communication um, and that faculty and professional staff have training, especially in the area of universal uh, design principles. Okay, the other area we looked at was really enrolling, supporting and retaining students with intellectual dis disabilities. This was a particular area that was concerning. Um, what we learned was there was really poor information and confusion on the definition um, that was in the Higher Education Opportunities Act. And in fact, in the actual um, um, training session that the Office of Post-Secondary Education did for the um, last re, um, competition where it, um, it appeared that people were defining, defining students with intel, intellectual disability, rather with autism, as students with intellectual disabilities. And that is not the case. And there's been real, we hear from uh, model demonstration programs, tips it's across the country that they're receiving pressure to really uh, admit students who do not have intellectual disabilities, but who are on the autism spectrum. So there's great need, you know, it's just this legislation in this particular program was not designed for that. And um, the recommendation was really around professional development, um, um, specifically on the characteristics of students with intellectual disability and what individualized planning and supports would um, look like to really ensure success and retention of students. It'll be interesting to see how Congress and the Department of Education responds to this. And all the standards um, based on the reviews that we did and the piloting uh, were revised for clarity and to ensure that, um, that there was individualized and, and supports, individualized planning and supports in academics and the key areas in the legislation around employment, uh, social aspects and overall independent living. And that there was professional development, training and supervision for students, for those who work with students with intellectual disabilities and how to best support them. And that students themselves were getting ongoing advice and counseling and support in all aspects of their program. And my goodness, I don't know what happened to this slide. My apologies for, the, um, it, at least on my screen, it's looking fuzzy unless that's my eyes, it could be my eyes. Um, so the recommendation to the Department of Education was specifically to correct the information provided to um, people who were applying for the last um, TIPSID application for funding and any future one on their web. It actually lists very confusing information on their website regarding the definition of intellectual disability. And to begin to look at who the uh, peer reviewers are for these programs and that they be trained. And it, it, um, some of the recommendations to Congress were looking at the RISE Act that allows students with disabilities to submit IEPs, 504 plans, or other documentation for accommodations from their disability service offices. And to make sure that training is, and technical assistance is provided to students, families, and uh, faculty around some of the RISE Act um, provisions. 
and specifically to fund some pilot programs for disability service offices to begin to provide services to students with disabilities beyond the typical 504 or ADA accommodations. An example might be looking at uh, peer mentors or, or coaches that might um, be provided. There was an increased focus on person-centered planning. What we found was there was a wide variation in what type of person-centered planning was used. Now, just as a point of reference, um, this is person-centered planning is required within the legislation. So programs who are getting this type of funding are required to conduct some type of um, person-centered planning. And, and what we found some, some were just very, um, well, what do you wanna do? And there was no process or structure to empower the student to really have more of informed choice about what some of their goals were. And a, a lot of the types of approaches to person-centered planning didn't really address all the students' needs. Um, so the a new standard was formed um, that requires program to document, to utilize an existing person-centered planning approach and to document what that is. And the guidance around that is a student-focused plan with specific goals and action steps that will lead to the student's vision for his or her future. This is not trying to establish IEPs for students in college. Please don't, I, I implore upon you not to go there. Um, it really, to, I think some of the um, areas that were included was um, a description of what works for the student, learning strategies, accommodation, and individualized supports and services I th that, that are known to work for the student. And I think all that information on a good summary could be found on a, a summary of performance that's required for students when they're exiting K-12. And the intent here with the last bullet is that the person-centered plan not be a lengthy document like an IEP. I, I think a lot of training needs to um, go out to help folks really see that this could be essentially a one or two page um, endeavor at a minimum. Okay, inclusion in classes, employment and the whole campus community community. What we learned were there were significant concerns that there were programs that did not meet the Higher Education Opportunity, Opportunities Act um, requirements around inclusion, or that students could take a very limited number of, of um, inclusive course options, but that was it. I mean, we saw several programs where they identified three courses in the course catalog that were inclusive and that's what students could take. So what started to happen is what we would see was an overrepresentation of students with intellectual disabilities in a number of these classes, and then they were no longer inclusive. The other area where <clears throat> we learned, and it was no surprise, is that there were, there were challenges in access, accessing uh, campus housing, uh, generic activities, and some of the services um, campus-wide. So the standard revision included more detail about what was meant by inclusive and an inclusive program of study, really around looking at um, that the course is in the course catalog for any student who did not have a disability or who did not have an intellectual disability. And that was, it was a broad array of courses um, and included access to facilities and um, 
most importantly support for um, housing. Now we learned around systemic barriers, fiscal sustainability and collaboration was a real challenge. And I don't think anyone who's here today would um, disagree with this uh, in terms of challenges with really accessing vocational re rehabilitation and other types of funds from uh, de developmental disabilities agencies, whether it's um, DD councils or um, DD agencies. And um, I think it's important to recognize this as an issue. And I know as the coordinating center and other advocates in the field are uh, constantly at work trying to um, get folks from the office, OSERS, the Office of Special Education Rehabilitation Services to really look at vocational rehabilitation services and funding and greater access, um, use of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act funds for transition age students, that student group in that 18 to 21 year old group that often gets stuck in high school because um, there's no uh, transition programs that are appropriate because the student's peer group goes on to college and or employment. Mo most, most students move on to both. So it's important to be able to use IDA funds to help support the student to be duly enrolled like their peers without disabilities. And it's also looking at um, veterans who have children uh, to, to benefit high, by higher education. Uh, looking at industry recognized credential programs, I think is going to is going to be the new frontier for us as the field at large on a national level. I know there's lots of work going on in Florida, and we're going to look to you as a model to help us figure this out, along with some of the apprenticeship programs. Okay. Jumping right to the recommendation to the Department of Education around difficulty accessing VR and other um, agencies type of funding. I think it's gonna be important to share employment and other uh, positive outcomes that we're seeing in these post-secondary education programs for students with intellectual disability. It's a real game changer and I, I think that we need to get the word out. Um, public awareness is gonna be critical around this, but for the, the state agencies, including Voc Rehab, um, and actually sharing examples of where programs are collaborating between uh, Voc Rehab and local educational agencies and post-secondary education programs. We need to show some really good positive examples so people can't say it's not happening because it, it is, it's just not enough. Family engagement is really critical. Um, and there's all kinds of challenges and things, issues within the, this particular area. And what we found was parents and, and programs had challenges regarding the different roles and expectations that each would fall under. So some of the standards revisions included requiring programs to have a, a deliberate communication around uh, general information about the program and on an ongoing basis. Um, uh, you know, what's the process for family engagement? what is being communicated about the roles and responsibilities, not just for students and families, but for staff as well. So that's a, a, a two-way or three-way street, if you will. And the language used 
in particular around um, the FERPA requirements are, are really, really important and how many students, not many, all students as a result of FERPA have control over parent involvement unless there's a guardian. And students have the right to waive the FERPA requirements and many programs in their orientation will ask students to sign a waiver. Um, I think it's gonna be important for programs to really get ongoing uh, stakeholder feedback from uh, students who are currently in a program, those who um, have exited and parents on how to improve their efforts for this um, engagement of students and families and what roles they should have. With the eye toward, obviously, toward continuous ongoing improvement. Now I'd like to go into some of the um, different focus for the work accreditation work groups that existed. The first round in the 2010 to 2015 really looked at establishing the standards. The second work group 2015 to 2020 really looked at field testing um, and getting public input on these particular standards and revising them. The, this current group, the 2020 to 2025, is gonna be critical in the, um, what we're doing right now, as actually as I speak, is reviewing a draft process uh, tools, developing related tools and materials to help implement this process for uh, implementing the standards. And then a critical amount of activity will be piloting the process tools and material. So we'll be looking for uh, folks, pro institutes of higher ed that have various aspects to their programming geographically, um, policies and practices to really see and um, really give us insight into um, what works and what doesn't work or needs to be modified. We're really looking for major um, stakeholder input in this next group. And this year, our focus was on establishing the new work group. And I'd like those of you in Florida to know that um, Drew is a, a, a major member of that work group. So he's, he's your linchpin to really getting more information out as, we, as the work evolves. And we'll certainly are happy to work with the Florida Center on providing um, more direct training on what those um, standards will be and the process for accreditation. We're focusing right now on what would the application look like to apply to be accredited. This is not a, it's not a simple process and it includes, it begins with including a self-study. We've developed some materials to help folks begin to think about this. So it's not a frustrating experience, but rather something that they feel is attainable. And we we're hoping that uh, we're really uh, probably modeling, not probably, we are gonna model our um, process around the AAQEP, AQIP, the Association for, again, another acronym, like we need another one, but it stands for Association for Advancing Quality in Education Preparation. What we liked about this particular approach to accreditation was its collaborative nature. And it was not a, a kind of like a gotcha uh, approach to accreditation. It's rather more we're in this together and we want to make it as painless as possible and meaningful as possible. So that's sort of where we're right in the throes of right now, along with developing the tools and materials for this process. 
Um, Martha Mock is the new accreditation chair. And she, she, I just met with her yesterday and she was showing me the guidance manual, uh, which will have uh, guidance and actually provide examples of evidence that will have to be produced so that we can, the um, reviewers can determine. And so you can determine if you're meeting the um, standard. It shouldn't be a surprise to anyone involved. And we'll also be developing the protocol for a site visit, an actual site visit. I think it will be a hybrid approach where there'll be um, online type of meetings and then face-to-face. -face. Uh, and what the last but not least is what the determination of whether you're approved in an accredited program or not will look like. I mean, these are, some of these are like almost gory little details, but they're very important elements of the work for the um, accreditation work group for this next four years, if you will. And then we'll be looking like we always are across all 10, 11 years of the um, accreditation different work groups is feedback on, on the materials. It's gonna be critical because that makes, that'll make or break for um, that we get as diverse uh, uh, feedback as possible uh, so that whatever the final process and materials are gonna look like, it should reflect the field and not just what someone thinks or what, let's use me in this, what Deborah Hart thinks would be a good process and materials to use. Now, the future work, as I was saying, really will have, um, again, feedback from other accrediting organizations. Now, we have had contact with the Association for Advancing Quality in Education Preparation, AQEP, and that man, Mark Sella, was just incredible. And he's gonna, he's um, already put us in touch with a number of different um, people who are, have either just um, gotten accreditation. An example is there's a woman who's the lead for the Montessori schools, and they were recently, um, accredited through, there's two different accrediting entities. One is NACIQI, N-A-C-I-Q-I, another acronym. Sorry, folks, I, I really apologize. NACIQI is the National Advisory Committee in, on National Quality and Integrity of Program Accreditors. And the other one is, I mentioned before, TIA, uh, C-H-E-A, which is again, the Council for Higher Education Accreditation. These programs would not fall under CHIA because you have to be offering an associate's degree or um, a bachelor's degree. So we're going to fall under the NASIKI, the National Committee, the National Advisory Committee on Internet, on Institutional Quality and Integrity. So we're already connecting with folks in order to pursue what that might look like and what's gonna be required. Again, as I mentioned before, the, the next year we'll be piloting all of this accreditation process and a very diverse group of programs so that we can ensure we've accomplished a, a very um, significant collected significant feedback from uh, folks. And then we'll have the, the fun task of refining and finalizing the process, again, based on feedback um, and, and hopefully um, developing something that uh, really will, the field will welcome and uh, want to participate in. Uh, and that, that, that means we're gonna need a lot of input and um, time spent on what this process could look like. And the last will be to look at what that accreditation determination report is gonna look like and make that actual recommendation. 
And all of this will be provided to hopefully a newly developed accrediting entity so that they can hit the streets running, if you will. We don't know who that will be or what it's gonna look like, uh, but there are specific guidelines under NSIGI, that National Advisory Committee on Institutional Quality and Integrity that will guide that work. You may be thinking, well, okay, so I know now I got, I downloaded the report to Congress and the Department of Education. How can I use the, these standards now? And that's a good question because I think it's important to start now because you'll be surprised to see there are many areas that you, you will have evidence and you will meet the standard and there will be many that you will not. I think they can be used currently for continuous quality improvement and pre be becoming more accreditation ready, if you will. Certainly students and families can use them when conducting uh, a college search. What to look for? It's really informative. Um, I did not know this before I started the accreditation work. Most institutes of higher ed, whether they're two year or four year, have a systems and tools in place that they use to collect data, evidence for accreditation. It would behoove you all, if you're operating an institute of higher in, within an institute of higher ed and you have a uh, post-secondary program for students with ID to really explore what are those systems and start to get familiar with them, if not use them <laughs> directly. Um, I think it's important to really look at data collection within a program around some of the evidence that's gonna be required so that you're not caught off guard. You've already got a system in place and it doesn't have to be really complicated or fancy. It could be, uh, you know, a, an Excel spreadsheet. Again, it's gonna be important as I mentioned earlier uh, to begin collecting or assessing uh, student learning and what plans you have for that within the program. Also looking at the, you know, literature, policies, procedures, handbooks, and making sure that they are current and updated, because those will be critical in uh, providing evidence and you don't want to have outdated material. And most of all, what I would recommend is looking at um, a few, like one or two of the standards to begin to um, collect evidence and review your um, practices pertinent to that particular standard. I, I think so that it's not overwhelming. If you start with all of them, I, I you know, it's, it, that's too large a task. So I think if you take a couple standards at a time and begin assessing, it will, um, be a much more positive experience and lend itself to some really good results. Okay, I hope I've left enough time for uh, questions. You have, you have. And there was one question, are there national standards to determine if, students, if a student is eligible for the CTP? Well, if I'm understanding the question correctly, the only national standards are the ones for, for students with intellectual disability who are attending uh, college programs are the standards that were developed by the coordinating center um, and have been finalized uh, as of last month. And those are down, uh, you can download that information from um, actually the, the, the website 
for this particular presentation because that's the report to Congress. It lists all that I've presented and the actual standards and um, related areas and the 38 standards for each of the 10 key areas. I'm not sure we are at a point to make a determination on what's going to happen with comprehensive transition program finance approval for federal financial aid in order to secure accreditation through that group that I keep calling um, your attention to Nasiki is uh, that there be financial aid offered by these programs. So I'm not sure what's going to happen that these accredited programs would have to be offering financial aid. So the department may or may not decide to roll CDP approval into this. That remains, stay tuned, that remains to be seen. Okay. Did that make any sense, Janice? <laughs> yes. Um, and I was wondering with the question, was that about who were intellectual disabilities or who were you know, students that fit in that category? I wasn't certain, but Amanda is on the call if that answered her question or not, if a student is eligible, because we have, for, our, for us, you know, they must have exited high school and have an intellectual disability following the, the federal definition, primarily AAIDD definition of what a intellectual disability that uh, that's what I was thinking is that it Amanda yeah oh yes yeah. Deb you mentioned um like programs being pressured to admit certain students um and being able to like, documentation that would be appropriate to say you know the student is eligible for you know the CTP what would be kind of like the standard for determining eligibility yeah and, and as you know, right now, that is up to the institution looking at the federal definition. I don't know if that'll change for us for intellectual disabilities. I don't know what, what would happen at the national level and that's aligned with the uh, HEA, uh, Higher Education Opportunity Act as well, what's an intellectual disability. It'll be interesting to see what the report to Congress, cause that's an area that, as I mentioned in my presentation, that is an area that we found was critical and um, we've made recommendations. So we'll, you know, we'll see if the Department of Education in particular, they may be forced by Congress to, in particular the health committee uh, to, to actually make some changes. Mm -hmm. And um, there was another question about the are the standards the same as the benchmarks in the planning tool? They align with those standards at the time. They're not exactly the same, but they definitely those benchmarks pull from what was in the, what was the thing college had at that time as their standards, along with other literature, um, other art man manuscripts that have been published, research manuscripts that have been published. And at the beginning of the planning tool, you'll see the, um, some of the references to how we determined what those benchmarks be, were um, based on the current um, literature and, and think college standards, but they're not exactly the same by no means. But I, I think it's gonna put you in some really good position mm -hmm. to once you go through that as you're planning to yeah. really begin to meet those accreditation standards because they're not really so far apart at right. least I haven't looked at it recently, Janice, but as I recall, having participated in it, I don't think it's really th that far apart. Right, I agree. We just need to be updated based on what we now see in the literature and what you guys are coming up with as well. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question, Amanda? Yeah, okay. Um, I didn't see any questions in the session on Hoover. Yeah. So I think, I think they were already answered. So we have a new question. Um, are there any discussions about, um, about, is there any discussions about how a national CTP certificate 
for branding recognition across the states? Like, will there be one standard, like, I'm assuming certificate for national CTP? I have not heard of that. Mm -hmm. Like in, you know what, what we used to have, um, of course, I can't think of it at this time, but our accreditation body, in Kate used to be, it's no longer, it's Kate now, you know, so like with the institutions of higher ed having to do the national accreditation, where in Kate used to be it, and now it's Kate, would it be that? Because that's a recognition that, of course, families- it, it, it Would it, the new agency that will be accrediting programs will be like in Kate used to be? but more with the flavor of the Association for Advancing Quality and Education Preparation. It's mm -hmm. a more collaborative process. And that's what I want this to be. Yeah. I, I don't want a gotcha kind of process, yeah. you know, it should be people are working together to develop these much more quality related programs. So mm -hmm. yes, there will be a national entity to do that. Yeah, And that brand and that recognition of it, like that certificate when a program gets it, That'll be something they want to, you know, show on their website or feature. You know, Correct. We've met this national standard and it'll be a brand that everybody would have and recognize. I think that's where the question was, was towards. Ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. But that's a good five years away. I know. Is that, that's a lot of work. <laughs> it is. And um, I think you answered the other question that was in here earlier about what are some of the biggest changes to national accreditation? And you answer that and presenting it right now, you know, what the changes are. But right now I don't see any other questions. Well, let me amend that response. It will be interesting to see what the Office of Post-Secondary Ed and Congress and the Department of Ed say to the report mm -hmm. and the recommendations. So that there, there's change brewing. I, I know that in, now that we're with a different administration, so a lot of the key people haven't been uh, cleared yet. So we don't even know, you know who some of those players are, but I think it's gonna be a different day. Okay. Exciting times. Yeah. No other questions at this time. I mean, this is perfect timing, Deb. I mean, five more minutes. Hoo hoo, he did it. <laughs> I was a little worried because you can have a tendency to go down the rabbit hole with this accreditation stuff. Mm -hmm. But, um, and unfortunately, there's these new acronyms that we'll probably all have to learn. Myself included, as you saw, I had my cheat sheet here. <laughs> I do. Drew, you want to take us, transition us? Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, that ends our morning keynote and general session. Thank you all.